Hi, welcome to DevOps Interviews. My name is Abel, and today we have a very, very special guest, Ronald Clems. Hey, Ronald, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing pretty good. So what do you do at Microsoft? Uh, so I'm a software engineer mm -hmm. on the pay management team. Mm -hmm. um, we manage uh, onboarding suppliers and partners across the world. Uh, you know, anytime we do business with uh, a partner or supplier anywhere, yeah. we have to onboard them to our system to ensure that they get paid uh, to comply with, you know, bank and tax regulations. And my team manages the code for uh, ensuring that that process is successful. So. Very cool. So recently, we've been doing a series on how Microsoft does DevOps, and specifically how the One IT VSO group does DevOps. So just and today we're going to do a deeper dive into the build and release pipelines that you all use. So so just to give our viewers a scale of how big One IT really is, how many builds and release pipelines do you guys have usually? Uh, I mean, that'd be a huge number. I think in ITVSO, there, there are thousands of teams uh, all within that entire organization. So uh, I know my team personally has probably 15 to 20 builds uh, easily. Yeah. Uh, so, if, you know, expound that upon that many thousands of teams, uh, it'd be a huge number. So we're this. talking about thousands and thousands of builds. And, and, well, just like for your team, how many builds do you guys run per day? Uh, so we have a number of builds running daily. Uh, just generally, you know, all of those builds at least will run one time, uh, if not several for the CI/CD pipelines themselves. Anytime we do a code check-in, we have gated builds that run. Uh, so these are these are full CI/CD pipelines where I, I can make a code change and it can propagate all the way out into production. Uh, it, we have some checks in place to to ensure that things will you know, be taken care of properly. But yeah, absolutely, we can get things all the way to production. Uh, Very cool. Let, let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at some okay. of the pipelines. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so what I'm looking at here is a, uh, a dashboard that we've built mm -hmm. that shows all of our builds and our releases, as well as the status of those as they occur throughout the day. Nice, um, okay. So if we were to dive into, say, one of our legacy builds, mm -hmm. Um, and before I s continue, I should mention that we're also undergoing a transformation in terms of the architecture of our solution. Okay. Uh, we're transitioning from, you know, a very monolithic, uh, very large scale application and breaking that apart into smaller microservices. Right. Uh, so one thing we've learned along this journey is that the build and release pipelines are very important, especially as the number of services increases, the complexity of how those services interact with deployments and whatnot. Sure. Uh, so. I can first jump into one of our legacy monolithic builds and okay. see what we've got going on there. So this is how you kick off a build for a, a monolith? Yeah, so for each okay. of our code bases, we have a gated build as mm -hmm. well as uh, the standard CI-CD build. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime a, a pull request is initiated, uh, a number of checks are in place, such as uh, cred scan, to ensure that there's no credentials uh, checked into that code so that they don't propagate into production automatically. Very cool. Um, you know, we run a fortify security analysis on all the code that's checked in. Uh, you know, manual reviewers on all of these code pull requests. Uh, a lot of processes in place to ensure that, you know, we don't kind of shoot ourselves in the foot by automating so many things and shooting stuff right into production. So even before code can hit master, just in the pull request, you guys kick off a build, you do scans, security scans, you do credential scans, you do uh, all sorts of things like that. So by the time the code gets merged into master, it's already past all of these quality gates. Yes, absolutely. And of uh, course, I'm assuming that part of the build, you're running unit tests as well? Yes, we're running unit tests. Uh, we've also recently integrated some sort of static analysis to ensure that our style uh, is complying with our standards. Um, you know, everyone has their own style, coding style, and we just right. want to make sure that uh, we're not adding warnings and things to the solution because of uh, those personal styles. So a lot sure. of checks in place in those gated builds. Sure, that's fantastic. All right, let's, let's go ahead and look a little bit deeper. Sure. Uh, so here you can see, you know, we're just building all the solutions. And it, as you can see, there's quite a bit of, you know, I mean, there's got to be 20 solutions in this application alone. Wow. Um, okay. And you can see where the complexity starts to to take build some traction, you know, as we multiply this over, I think we have 15 applications at least. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see how it's, it's very important to stay on top of this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty massive build with 20 different solutions that you're building all yeah. at once. And that's why we're undergoing such a painful process to break this apart into smaller uh, solutions, you know. Got it, got it. So uh, I, I want to dive into this build a little sure. bit deeper just because this is pretty cool to me. All right, so the process now is I make some code changes, I do a pull request, and, and before the code even moves into master, 
it goes it goes through a build, it goes through uh, security scanning. You got all this stuff going on to help ensure quality. Unit tests mm -hmm. are run. When that's done, the code gets merged into master. Does it kick off another build that goes through the full pipeline that that pushes the code out? Yeah, absolutely. So after the gated build completes, mm -hmm. uh, we're in an unfortunate circumstance where we're a little dependent on our SAP counterpart. Uh, yep. So in terms of the end state is we'd like to be able to spin up an environment on demand mm -hmm. uh, and, and tear down those resources, uh, utilize you know less cost and waste. Uh, but SAP is very uh, strict in terms of their process and nice. we have to depend on that and utilize you know certain uh, environments that we have to maintain in a static way. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, we have, I think, five environments for each application. Okay. Uh, so part of the process is once the gated build completes, uh, that will kick off a CI/CD build mm -hmm. to the lower environments. Okay. If those are successful, we'll propagate into respective higher environments. So when, when code gets pushed into one of these lower environments, um, do more tests get run? Like, like what type of what type of quality gates occur from the lower environments all the way out into production? Yeah. Uh, so the lower environments, um, for example, we have two lower environments that we you know call dev and test that are not so dependent. They're actually not connected on SAP, okay. and that's uh, I consider those very unstable environments in that we're often you know shooting untested code there to kind of verify that things are working across the network traffic and whatnot. Sure. Uh, but even in those environments, we do run functional tests on those releases. Um, you know, all the standard checks that would go into the gate to build and whatnot also uh, carry over into those lower environments as well. Very cool, very cool. So then I'm in one of these lower environments, everything looks good. It passes, a, let's assume I'm running some automated UI testing and other things like that. At the end of that, is there a manual approval process before it goes on to the next environment? Uh, so we used to do a, you know, thorough testing uh, that the UAT practice as well, uh, I think is something that we're trying to consider legacy at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to do away with it to be more agile. Uh, but in terms of manual process, we've really done a great job of you know, mitigating that and trying to automate as much as possible. Cool. Very cool. So our, in, I know inside of Azure DevOps, there is the concept of automated approval or, uh, yeah, automated mm -hmm. approval gates. Yes. Um, are you guys using any of those, or, or is this all being yeah. done in a... We, we do use the, the approval feature at times. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's not always on. Mm -hmm. uh, with the number of environments that we have, I think at times it can be cumbersome. Uh, sure. You know, people are very busy, and, and it's, it takes a lot to kind of get someone's approval if we need something quick. Uh, but there are times where we do need an environment uh, for, say, a large feature that's being released, and we need to do some testing there. We want to verify that the code that's deployed there uh, is not overwritten by some automated process. And yep. we'll, in that case, use the uh, you know, the approval process there. So just me being curious now, uh, when you're deploying into these environments, are these are these physical machines that you're deploying to? Are these endpoints in Azure? Or or what are we deploying into? Like, what's, what's your typical environment look like? Yeah, um, so it really depends on the application we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we're breaking apart into smaller microservices. So if we're deploying the legacy uh, monolith, uh, it's very cumbersome, very time consuming. We have a lot of cloud services and you know things being deployed to VMs and whatnot. Uh, the future state or where we're headed is uh, Azure Service Fabric and we're deploying a lot of things there uh, very automatically right from the pull request approval, propagating through the environments and into production right away. Okay. So are you guys using any any infrastructure as code or is it just, okay, my environment's already pre-built and hooray for that, we just push code through? Yeah, we have a number of PowerShell scripts in our solution that are run as a part of the uh, initial portion of the release mm -hmm. to kind of uh, use ARM templates to set up the environment. Um, you know, we have some service fabric uh, PowerShell scripts that are run to kind of uh, propagate those environments if not already created and whatnot. Um, like I said, we're working to get to a point where we can tear down and build up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a long road given the state that we're in. Yeah. Uh, but we're certainly headed there. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I was the reason why I asked. I was recently doing an EBC where I was talking about infrastructure as code, and there was some IT people, and they looked at me and they just said, "That's great in theory, but that's just not possible." Hmm. And I started asking, "Well, why isn't it possible?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we're we're running on physical machines on iron." 
Mm-hmm. And I started thinking, well, no, you still can use things like Chef or Puppet mm-hmm. and still do infrastructure as good. And he's like, no, you can't. And I said, well, no, you can't. It, it's hard, but you can. And then he mm-hmm. challenged me, what does your IT team do? And I'm like, actually, I have no idea, which is why <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask. Sure. Um, so one thing we're doing right now, actually, and I think this is very interesting. Um, I don't know of any other teams doing this, but in our legacy solution, we have a lot of cloud services. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's an initiative to kind of get get away from using those uh, the legacy services and whatnot. So what we've done is, as we move to Service Fabric, we're actually containerizing those cloud services cool. and putting those in our Service Fabric application to remove you know any trace of VMs that we have and any legacy cloud services. Very cool. So very cool yeah. stuff you guys are doing. So all right, so this is like a, a typical build for 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 a monolith. And you said you you've been slowly teasing these this apart. Yeah. How far along is that process? Um, I mean, we still got quite a way to, ways to go. We've identified several services that we intend to break into, mm-hmm. um, and those are logical services based on the workflow of the application. Um, a user comes and enters their tax information, and then they enter their banking information. Mm-hmm. And we've kind of found a logical separation there. Got it. Uh, we've broken apart the bank application, and now mm-hmm. that's a standalone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still very heavily dependent on the monolith. Mm-hmm. Uh, we utilize an anti-corruption layer to kind of uh, interact with that solution without destroying the data, uh, the business logic there. Got it. But that bank service is, has its own CICD release pipeline. Uh, it's live in production today. Cool. Um, the the UI and the server side code are all separate, mm-hmm. uh, completely metadata driven. Yeah. So. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool stuff. So so you, you have started the process of teasing apart the monolith. Yeah. So when you start, well, I just started thinking, okay, if, if you've already teased it apart a little bit, and they have separate CI/CD pipelines, which mm-hmm. makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. the point of microservices is you can deploy them separately. It, how do you guys deal with things like um, de- service dependencies on each other? Um, it, are you just super careful about the order of how you deploy stuff, or is there some way that you can mitigate that type of problems where if service A depends on service B, then I can't upgrade service A until I upgrade service B first? Mm-hmm. And then if there are even more, it kind of turns into chicken and egg thing. Mm-hmm. How do you guys manage that? Yeah, uh, that was the situation we kind of uh, designed for. And, you know, we'd heard from other teams that that was a possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what really helped us was the anti-corruption layer that we planned for. Uh, it references the main legacy solution, uh, you know, all over the place. So we're able to deploy that independently. If mm-hmm. there's a change in, say, the legacy system that would affect the bank service or vice versa, yeah, uh, we can deploy that at any time without affecting the legacy solution. Uh, and we've also containerized those ACLs and put those in the service fabric itself with the bank service there. Uh, so really, the network traffic is very limited. It's all within the service fabric. Got it. Got it. So, all right. <clears throat> Switching gears. Um, who can kick off your builds? Is it just anybody? If I check in code, will it just kind of start flowing through the pipeline? Or is there like special steps mm-hmm. that have to happen before code gets pushed out? Yeah, I mean, anyone can initiate a pull request. Uh, that code will be reviewed manually mm-hmm. by a few individuals, depending on the code base, uh, myself included for most of those. And uh, as long as the approval's there, you know, all unit tests pass, all the gated tests pass, um, mm-hmm. things of that nature, uh, there's really no uh, stop to say who can and can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have a process, though. We have a DRI who's really in charge of all the production deployments and all the production issues, yeah. uh, which we rotate through, uh, you know, two weeks in that role uh, to kind of give everyone the exposure to the production side of things and uh, to kind of share that workload more so. Um, but yeah, anyone anyone can really kind of just as, as we see fit. Perfect, yeah. perfect. So is there... Is there a certain cadence that you guys work where you, like, I know with the Azure DevOps team, every three weeks, like clockwork, they, they're pushing code out into production. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is that something that you guys do as well, where you work in a cadence and deploy in a cadence? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have come from, uh, in our Agile transformation, very far. And we used to do you know, quarterly releases, mm-hmm. uh, kind of shorten that down to monthly releases. Mm-hmm. And now we're at a point where we deploy to production, I'd say, every Friday. Uh, wow. Once yeah. a week. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, we found that, you know, because our application is used all over the world with, uh, you know, it's it's very business heavy. So, you know, we think kind of a nine to five mm-hmm. uh, 
we deploy Fridays after that time to kind of reduce the traffic. Uh, uh, got it. And we have, you know, as I said, a lot of cloud services, so there's a brief bit of downtime, mm -hmm. and we have to plan accordingly for that. But uh, we try to go every Friday, and we're on a two-week sprint cadence. Yeah. And that I think has worked out pretty well for us. So when you do when you do a deploy, how long does one of your deploys take? Um, like, for instance, yeah. like if, if I if I have a new feature that I just pushed into I did a pull request. And it's merged into, it passed everything, so merged into master, and now it starts to flow. How long does it take from then all the way to when the code sitting in production and I can mm -hmm. see it as a client? Yeah, uh, so if we're talking about the legacy service, uh, quite a bit of time, actually. It's a huge application. Uh, we're running a lot of tests on that. Sure. Uh, so that will take upwards of, uh, say, maybe two hours from pull request start to, mm -hmm. to release finish. Mm -hmm. uh, the microservice, I, we're doing a lot better there uh, in terms of, you know, from start to finish, we could probably have that done in about 30 minutes to 45 minutes tops. Yeah, that's it. Do you guys do like uh, daily hot fixes or, or just hot fix when, when it comes? Um, or even yeah. don't need to do hot fix since you guys are pushing it out every Friday. I mean, it's just like there's a bug. Well, we'll fix yeah. it and Friday we'll push it out. Yeah, there are times, uh, I would say they're far less common now that we're doing weekly releases. Yeah. Uh, but there are certainly times where we do a hot fix uh, in the middle of the week as needed. Um, and we try to just be flexible, you know, as flexible mm -hmm. as we can be, uh, try to meet the needs of the customer. And if there's an issue and we have to release that day, then we have to do so, you know, and we have the process in place to do that. Very cool. Very cool. Um, finally, uh, last question here. I get asked this all the time. What if you deploy something, somehow it passes through all the gates, gets into production, you're like, uh oh, that's not right. Yeah. Or do you roll back? Do you roll back? Do you just roll forward? What's, what's the process there? Yeah. Uh, I'll talk again in terms of the legacy versus the, the new architecture. Uh, we Luckily, ITVSO keeps you know a pretty extensive history, uh, mm -hmm. all the logs of all the releases, the, the build numbers, uh, and it, they've made it very easy for us to identify uh, the most recent deployment to the, each environment. Yeah. Uh, so if we have an issue in production and we have to roll back, uh, we have a history and it's just a matter of clicking deploy from that previous build. Cool. Um, and in terms of the, the microservice architecture, uh, it's a it's a you know a rolling upgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to do that, we would just redeploy the same build uh, from the previous build, uh, and it would you know with no downtime uh, upgrade each node independently there. Yeah. So a uh, quick question, and I'm kind of drifting away from the build and release pipeline just because I'm like totally fascinated. For your team, how many repos are we talking about? Uh, so that's a tough question to answer because we're, we're changing that, you know, we're undergoing Fair that enough. transformation, but I think, uh, I would estimate about seven repos at this point. Is it like a repo per microservice? Yeah, that's what we're striving towards okay. is that each, uh, repo has its own, you know, each microservice is its own repo. Yeah. Uh, we separate those code bases logically and, you know, I think end state, we'd like to ensure that those don't talk to each other. They talk through a service bus or event driven model. Um, and, you know, we'd like to keep them as separate as we can so that independent deployments become the norm. Got it. Man, this is freaking awesome. I, I love peeling back the layers of what Microsoft really does. Um, and it, it's one thing when I show demos of like one little project, right? But it's a whole other thing when you're talking about an, a seriously large application in a large organization. DevOps in theory is, is a little bit different than DevOps at scale in, in a real environment. So thank you so much for showing us how you guys do your CI/CD pipelines and thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.